Good afternoon, Mary Beth. Good afternoon. I thank you How for you? Uh, awesome, awesome. Thank you for agreeing to participate in the spotlight. My pleasure. All right, awesome. So what I'll do is I'll start with your bio and then we'll okay. get into it. So we are here with Mary Beth Sweeney. She is a partner with the law firm of Atwood and Cherney and has been with the firm since 1998. Her practice includes all aspects of domestic relations and probate litigation in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. A significant portion of her practice involves custody matters and children's issues, including the impact of a child with special needs on divorce case. She has expertise in custody removal, visitation, and Hague Convention matters where a parent abducts a child to another country. Ms. Sweeney was one of the trial attorneys responsible for the first highlighted virtual visitation case in Massachusetts as it pertained to a creative method of contact for a non-custodial parent in a removal matter. A component of her practice also includes representing family members in estate litigation matters in both the probate and superior courts of, of the Commonwealth. Mary Beth is elected is an elected trustee with the American Inn of Court, currently serving a four-year term. She is a past president of the Massachusetts Family and Probate American Inn of Court and is the past president of the North Shore Woman in Business. She is a trained mediator and collaborative law attorney and works as a parent and coordinator. That is impressive. I am. Thank you. I, yeah, I feel like I'm amongst royalty here. <laughs> so, you know, you know, it's when you talk about divorce, right? You know, on, on my end, you know, I, I deal with the financial end of things, and and you just assume you got the agreement, and you assume everything, everybody's going to follow the rules, you know, to the agreement, and. So one of the things here that struck me is, um, you know, forget about the support, no one paying the support. If someone takes a child and not supposed to, let alone out of the state, but the country, how, how does that work when you try to, it's a big world out there and trying to find that person. With international kidnapping cases, you generally have an idea of where they're going to go. They might, hopefully it's a country that is a signatory to the Hague Convention, um, in which case you can usually find private investigators that will help track people down. If a child is abducted to a non-Hague Convention country, then the process is much more difficult to um, extract them and repatriate them. You have to go through the U.S. State Department. You try to flag their passports. You still generally have an idea what country that they went to, but then you have to um, use uh, foreign resources and foreign court systems to help work your way through in order to locate the children, perhaps do a child well check visit, and then have your client work both in the US side and in the foreign country side in order to try and get the child to be returned. And how cooperative do you find these countries when it comes to this? Hague Convention countries are very cooperative. When you when we're talking about a non-Hague Convention country, it's it's not impossible to get a child back, but it's much more difficult and you have to find something that will entice the uh, parent that is the one who abducted the children to come back or return to the United States or it give them some carrots. And some of those carrots could be economic incentives. You don't want to ever trade children for money, but if you want your child badly enough and the parent who abducted the children left because they didn't have a home, they didn't have resources, you provide them with a home and resources. I found that the the more you offer them, the more likely that you're going to get some cooperation. Oh, that makes sense. So, in terms of your practice, I mean, you you it looks like you could have pretty much done anything in your life. What what, what drove you to a to family law practice? Well, when I graduated from uh, college, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. People think that you go to law school and you're automatically going to know what you want to do. But there yeah. are many, many fields of law. So I worked three to four jobs all between undergrad and law school, including one job at a family law firm. Um, it has since disbanded. One of the partners passed away that I used to work with. And I really enjoyed the aspect of family law because you go to court right away. You're not sitting behind a desk somewhere. You are meeting clients right away and you're able to try cases right away. 
Um, in some of the larger law firms that I worked at, um, people would be stuck behind a desk for five, six, seven years while the partners tried cases and they never got any practical experience. Many of these young lawyers never even met with clients. They were literally just researching and writing and providing support. Um, as I traveled through different areas of law from real estate to debt restructuring to um, asbestos defense litigation, something that really struck me was my love for family law. So then when I started law school, I went nights, I still work days. I um, found classes that were specific to the area of family law and started targeting those classes. Then I found the one law firm I wanted to work at and applied at that law firm in February of my uh, final year of law school. They hired me right away to start as soon as I took the bar exam and I've been there ever since. Oh, that's awesome. So divorce, no two divorces are the same. Everybody has their own unique journey. In the beginning, what, what kind of heads up advice would you give someone who was just starting to think about getting divorced? Like, you know, first yeah. decide if this is really what you want to do, because you if you're going to have a litigated divorce, you're embarking upon uh, at a minimum with COVID and all of the court closures and the uh, delays that COVID has caused a two year process. I talk to people about the benefits and the expediency of alternative forms of dispute resolution, such as mediation, collaborative law, um, conciliation, and then describe to them uh, the benefits. If you're in New Hampshire, for example, and you have a completely mediated case, you enter into all of your agreements and then they are submitted to the family division in New Hampshire and they are allowed without you ever needing to step foot in a courtroom. In Massachusetts, if you resolve all of your issues, you need mm -hmm. only attend one hearing. Most judges will allow that one hearing to be by Zoom where they essentially bless your agreement and then you get your judgment in the mail. If you're going to embark upon a litigated process, then someone is going to file, you have to wait till the summons comes from the court and then you have temporary orders. You might have discovery disputes along the way. You might have nuanced issues such as if someone owns a business, you're going to have to have a business valuation. You might have commercial property that needs to be valued or residential property. All of that, you're looking at about six months to do that discovery work. Then you have your pretrial conference. If it doesn't settle at that point, you get a trial. And I'm always reminding clients that our trials are not like Judge Judy, whether it's a one day <laughs> trial or a 20 day trial. They're not going to bang down the gavel at the end and say, this is what I'm going to do. At the end of a trial, the judge has time and it can be as much as 30 days, two months, depending on the length of the trial, to have each side make their post trial submissions. And then a judge has as long as they wish to enter a decision. I've waited as long as 14 months for decisions to okay. come back from the probate court. And during all of that time, your life is passing. Usually with that lecture, most people are looking to move their case towards mediation or conciliation. Yeah, so I mean, with litigation, like what percent would you say ends up getting settled anyways and they probably feel they shouldn't have even gone down that path to begin with? I would say it's about 96% of cases settle. It's the rare case that actually has to be tried in either New Hampshire or Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. So I, I could see more and more people going from uh, the mediation, starting from mediation and then um, litigation if it if all else fails. I mean, some mm -hmm. I imagine those three percent that need to be litigate needed to be litigated. They they did. You know, it's you know because not everyone, you know, plays nice. I suppose. And that's uh, true. Yeah, especially, um, you know, when you have to start doing the forensic, you know, on the, on the money end of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and and some of them, I can imagine, it's just blatantly obvious that, obvious that someone has, makes a lot more money than what they portray, especially when they pull up with a very expensive automobile. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then they show up with a financial statement where they say they have zero income. Yeah. And then you're doing a deep dive in those tax returns, the corporate tax returns. There's so many places that people can hide money. Um, but I like to put my team together right from the get go. If I know that I'm going to have a litigated divorce case and I've got a value business and I've got commercial real estate to deal with and there's going to be refinancing, 
I have my clients right away start talking to experts so they have an idea of the overall cost to yep. add those experts into a divorce case, but also so they can begin to have answers that judges will eventually ask them, such as, okay, Mary Beth, your client would like to buy this $1.9 million home. It has got a $200,000 mortgage. So client is going to have to refinance to take out additional equity from that property. Is he, she going to qualify for that refinance? Right. And if the answer is, judge, I, I didn't even think about that, then you're not really doing your job. That's why I call you. Yeah, no, absolutely. They got to get pre-approved. I always say pre-approved for a divorce. What do you mean? Well, mm -hmm. exactly that. Yeah. Um, so without getting into too much detail, is there a particular case or an incident that like impacted you the most that you still remember um, that, you, that you said like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of really interesting cases. I have uh, one case that's back around again for yet another round of litigation. It was a uh, case in New Hampshire that had a domestic violence component. It had, okay. Then it had, that was tried. Then it had a prenuptial agreement component that was tried. It got moved from the traditional family division to what's called the complex docket. After the prenuptial agreement was determined by the court, then we embarked upon a very lengthy multi-day trial on uh, a whole host of complex assets. One side was aggrieved by the judge's decision. It went up to the Supreme Court in New Hampshire and was appealed. And now it's been what's called remanded, which means we're back again in the family division. So that case has been going on for about seven years. Wow. Wow. So, all right. Well, we're almost out of time here. Do you have like one final thought you would like to leave with us today? Whatever you decide to do, make sure that you are prepared. Make sure you come to lawyer meetings asking questions and make sure you leave having all of the answers provided to you. And make sure you get their business card because inevitably after you leave a client meeting, they go home and then they think about very many additional questions they wish to ask. And you want to give them an opportunity to ask you everything that they need to. And if someone were, wanted to get on the path with you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Best way is to email me at mbsweeney with an EY at atwoodcherney.com or call my assistant, Anna, and she will get you on my calendar. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, Mary Beth, this has been awesome. I appreciate you jumping on here. My pleasure, John. It's good to All see right. you. All right. You as well.